Hello, my name is Nicholas Morgan, and I'm an editor at Album News, and this is Turkey Abroad. Joining me today is Dr. Zenonis Ziaris at the Prio Center in Nicosia, Cyprus. Zenonis, pleasure to have you. Good to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. So we, we've had some pretty pretty significant news on the sanctions front this in the last week now. First, the European Union had their summit last week where they discussed new, the possibility of new sanctions against Turkey. And then on Monday, the United States moved ahead with the Katsa sanctions over the purchase of the S-400 sanctioning members of the Turkish defense industry. So the first question I wanna ask you, Zanonis, is how does this affect the current state of affairs in the East Mediterranean in relation to Turkey taken together? Well, um, as you know, this, um, this uh, talk about the sanctions is a, is a recurring discussion, both um, uh, with regard to, to the EU and the US. I mean, this is not the first time that, um, that the current presidency in the US is imposing sanctions on, on Turkey. Uh, we saw that previously with the case of, of Pastor Branson. Um, uh, but uh, um, I think that this is changing things um, to some extent, but not perhaps to the extent that many people think. Um, because on the one hand, you have an EU that is um, evidently weak and un uh, unwilling to adopt a harsher stance against Turkey, uh, mainly because of the main interests that are stake. Um, and the different um, dependencies that exist between Turkey and various EU member states of the EU, uh, for example, uh, Germany, um, Italy, uh, Austria, and, and so on. So uh, even, even France, uh, to be honest, uh, which is traditionally more you know, uh, strict in terms of, of, of Turkey matters. So that's one thing. And, and the EU has uh, demonstrated a degree of... Um, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in credibility. Uh, so it's not really credible uh, when it comes to uh, following through with, uh, with warnings uh, against Turkey. I mean, we, if we go and back and see um, the results, uh, the conclusions of the, of, of not the previous, but the one before uh, European Council, uh, we will see that um, what uh, the EU warned that uh, they would do to Turkey or the measures that they would impose depending on Turkey's behavior, they did not follow through this time. They only imposed, uh, they basically added a few names on that list with, with the measures. Um, so nothing, nothing to see there, uh, business as usual, uh, hoping that they will be able to, to maintain a, a working relationship, a functioning relationship with, with Turkey. On the other hand, you have, you know, across the Atlantic, you have a different uh, approach to things, but also a delayed um, you know, um, um, uh, sort of response from the U.S. on this, because the Katza discussion has been going on for a while, and um, it's it's only you know um, they only impose the sanctions when things couldn't go any any, any further. Uh, Trump had to uh, sort of uh, respond to the Congress uh, demands, uh, and when he when 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 um, when the time came, uh, he did not really impose serious sanctions. I mean, he could impose sanctions on the banking sector, on the economy, things that they would really damage um, the, the Turkish economy and, and cause a lot of political problems uh, to Turkey as well. Instead, he focused mainly on the, on the defense sector and on, on specific uh, uh, persons in that domain, uh, obviously affecting the Turkish defense industry. Um, uh, and, and, and more so in the long run. Uh, but at the same time, I think that um, uh, the US is also trying to, to leave some space to Turkey uh, to save face and, um, and maybe come back to the negotiating table and, and uh, renegotiate or discuss both the matter of, of S-400 missiles, but uh, other matters as well. So we will have to observe how things will uh, progress from now on. And, and see whether uh, the Erdogan government, despite their proclamations about retaliating and so on, uh, might fall back and, and try to, um, to, to discuss things with, with the, the US and particularly with the new administration. So in, in Turkey, ahead of the EU, EU summit last week, 
there there was some there was some suggestion in a few uh, of the Turkish Turkish media outlets that were they were saying that they did not expect really serious action to come from that summit against Turkey, and it does seem somewhat somewhat validated since they announced that they were going to expand the name the list of individuals and entities that they would sanction, but without explicitly naming who they'd be adding to it. And going into the summit, of course, we had France, Greece, and Cyprus particularly pushing hard for sanctions. But in the absence of anything more than a commitment to expand this list, how is this decision really being received in, say, Athens or Nicosia about the approach to Turkey? Well, I think Erdogan himself said that he did not fear uh, EU sanctions. And and as you rightly put it, um, they, they were uh, right. Um, um, and that's because of, of what I mentioned before, the, you know, um, the degree to which uh, the EU and, and various members uh, need Turkey for, for different things. Um, now, right now in Nicosia and, and Athens, um, at the at the political level, this is this is promoted as, as some as some kind of a victory, you know, um, uh, not 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 to um, they don't boast too much about it, but that's how they they portray it. Uh, on the other hand, you have the the, the social level, uh, the public opinion that um, uh, that does not like what what's what's happening and what's going on because they they see the EU time and again. Um, you know, taking this um, uh, very light uh, approach uh, to Turkey, uh, not being able to um, actually uh, dictate the terms of the game and, uh, and, and sort of manipulate, if you will, or affect uh, Turkey's uh, policies and, um, and stance. So there is a disappointment um, on that level in this regard. And um, I think this might, you know, in the long run, have some some sort of a political effect um, on on the on the governments uh, in the elections or, or or whatever. But right now, uh, I think most people understand that the EU is very limited in what it can do. You know, foreign policy has always been a major limitation of the EU. And I think this doesn't, doesn't change. If you, if you look at the conclusions of the latest summit, you will actually see that, um, that, that they are calling for the US to be involved in this. So you can see how the EU is actually admitting that it is still dependent on the US to, um, to follow through on, on important matters of, of foreign policy. You know that that that's that's something that's really interesting too because in in a report I read in the Greek the Greek media they were saying that even even Macron even President Macron of France he was persuaded by Germany in particular to wait to wait on this round until the Joe Biden administration really settles into office or in the next year. But I have to I have to ask because you know, we we saw at least under Trump there was or at least through Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, there was a lot there was a lot of interest in the East Mediterranean issue from him. And he seemed to be trying to move the US closer to the Greek position on the matter. But now that we're going towards this this point where the EU is hand handing the ball to the US on the sanctions front, what what do you what what does it mean to you for them to essentially take this approach, to rely on the US to take the lead on the sanctions front related to Turkey? Well, I, I think they just want the US more involved. I mean, they can understand, they understand that um, there's only so much they can do uh, um, in regard to, um, with regards to Turkey. Um, and they understand that the US is, is much more capable uh, in, in um, applying pressure on Turkey and achieving political results. In, in, so they, I think they want to, uh, link sort of the the, the problem the problems of the two you know uh, sides of the Atlantic uh, in respect to Turkey um, and and they and they would also like uh, I think they, they they also call for a different approach from the U.S. Uh, in, during the new administration uh, in Washington 
Uh, I think that that's what they're calling for. And um, uh, but to, to take another perspective, um, we should also see the U.S. policy in the region. And um, uh, I, I think that it hasn't really changed um, over the past years, even from from Obama. And I don't think that it will change much in the next years. And that approach is is the approach of you know retreating from the region to some extent from from having let's say more boots on the ground, but at the same time trying to create uh, the necessary relationships and partnerships with local actors. Um, and at this point in time, Cyprus, Greece, Israel, we see what's happening with Israel, uh, their approachment with the Arab world, the Muslim world uh, more generally. So this is their new uh, approach that has been going on for a while, maybe almost 10 years. Um, and uh, I think this works in two ways. One way is, is that these actors will be able to uh, serve or complement U.S. interests in the region. And the other way that this works is that it sort of creates, um, let's say, uh, um, a, a stick uh, logic vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. So, you know, so they're sending the message that, you know, if, if, if Turkey does not sort of um, come back to the West or uh, adopt a different approach in, in dealing with the West, then we have alternatives in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean that we can use at the expense of, of, of Turkey. Uh, and I think the, the EU is understanding this approach and because themselves cannot really do it the same way, they're calling for, for the US to help them in, in managing Turkey. And do you, do, you, do you think with Biden coming in, it, it could end up being more effective in that front, considering I imagine there was a lot of distrust considering Trump's close relationship with Erdogan and Biden has a lot of experience with with Turkey and on in the East Mediterranean in general from his time as a senator and then of course as vice president. But he he's made it a point that he wants to, you know, strength, strengthen U.S. alliances that he felt atrophied under the Trump administration. And at least Greece and Turkey are both part of NATO, and we could see the interest there. But I, of course, a lot of arguments in the U.S. sometimes go that they don't want to push Turkey too hard or they might drift further towards Russia. It was floating around between Germany and France and they didn't want to push too, Turkey too far away. Do you think that's gonna be a concern that they might still be at risk of watering down any action or do you think it just kind of creates the conditions for at least a more effective exchange of ideas on how to solve the situation and deescalate tensions? Uh, sorry, I, I lost you for a while there. Could you maybe summarize the question? Do you, do you, no, no problem. Do you, do you think that Biden's concern about rebuilding, rebuilding alliances, whether, say, in this case, NATO, and not pushing Turkey too far towards, say, Russia and China, do you think that might water down? Do you think that that just sets more, more condition, a better stage to really negotiate these differences and de-escalate? Sure, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that the, the, the new administration would be, um, you know, uh, um, uh, almost the same uh, in essence with the previous one, um, meaning that they will still follow a, a logic of, of transactionalism. So they, they, they will maintain a transactional relationship with Turkey, but at the same time have this carrot and stick approach. Um, trying to doing their best to keep Turkey close uh, to the U.S. Um, the, the the historic dilemma that um, that the U.S. is facing right now with regard to Turkey is that it realizes the problematic um, you know the, the problems that that Turkish foreign policy is causing for the U.S. in the region and 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 beyond. But at the same time, they also realize. That if they are, if they adopt a harsher stance towards Turkey, they will indeed push pu push it away towards you know Eurasianism, um, the Russia, China, and generally non-Western and even anti-Western actors, as we've seen Turkey developing such relationships. So um, we might be surprised uh, and see uh, Biden actually uh, try making more efforts in that respect. So trying to lure Turkey 
uh, back to, to the US by providing some carrots, but at the same time, um, uh, continuing the, this uh, policy of sticks that uh, Trump on some level and to some extent uh, started. You know, uh, when, when they, when the European, at the end of the European summit, when they released the, the new resolution, it in many ways looked exactly like the one that they produced in October, talking about the need to continue diplomacy, but also keeping room for sanctions. There was, there was one change that stood out to me, and that was that they mentioned taking, taking these issues beyond the Eastern Mediterranean, talking about assessing the relationship with Turkey in the entire region. And that seems to echo at least some of the French position about Turkish actions, whether it's in Syria or Nagorno-Karabakh or in Libya. But what I, what I wanna ask is, do you think, of course there's a connection between all these topics, especially say Libya, Syria, the refugee, the refugee situation, the East Mediterranean. But do you think that this is a realistic, a realistic expectation of the EU to try to go this approach? Or do you think this is something that's going to be also supported by the US or enabled by the US to actually succeed? Yeah, I, I think you're right in that um, um, this statement sort of reflects uh, the concerns of certain EU member states, um, particularly France uh, and Greece and, um, and Cyprus. Um, I think the EU can, you know, observe and, and, and review and report on, on Turkish policy in the broader region. And um, it is a justified thing to do because uh, I think there is a common now, a con that there is a consensus and a common understanding that um, Turkish regional policy is not a defensive policy like like um, 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 officials in Ankara would like to uh, uh, say. Uh, it's it's more it's more of a revisionist policy that you know extends uh, far beyond Turkey's borders and and sort of defines uh, national security in in terms of of regional um, uh, in, in doctrine uh, stretch hegemony. So. Um, I think that the EU can, uh, you know, do do that, but I don't think they can be effective in dealing with that. So um, uh, the US comes in um, uh, when 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 we are when we are talking about this, and um, they are more capable, as I said before, in, in dealing with this um, issue and this problem. But overall, I don't think I don't see how, at least at the time being, they will be able to. Um, limit or restrict uh, Turkish actions uh, in in the in the area because they are a bit too late. Uh, the, the, both the reactions of the EU and the US are uh, seem to me at least to be too little, too late, because Turkey is already out of hand um, to to a certain degree, and um, there is only so much you can do to. Um, negotiate with Turkey, uh, but but not actually impose uh, anything on Turkey. It's it's very difficult to do that at this point in time. So we will we'll, we'll have to wait and see how things will pan out in terms of, of managing these different relationships. You know, one, one thing that Turkey seems to seem to suggest that they, they've suggested in the context of their relationship with the United States, at least, is that they would like they would much rather prefer to say, compartmentalize some of their issues in many ways, kind of like what they do with Russia. And it does seem it does seem that they will not want to really bunch in together the disputes with Greece and Cyprus on the one hand, and then, of course, their policies in Libya, which aggravates France, of course, and is obviously connected to that maritime deal they concluded last year with the GNA in Tripoli. And it just seem, it just seems like this approach and they wanted to connect all, all these issues. It just seems like it would just have no momentum that Turkey would not be interested in really tying all of these together, especially um, if I remember correctly, they last week at the summit, they w introduced a human rights framework for sanctions on the EU level. And Turkey's absolute doesn't seem like it would be very interested in hearing about that from the EU or anyone anytime soon. Well, I think you're exactly right in that um, what, what Turkey is doing uh, is, is 
is try to develop these compartmentalized relations, uh, not just with um, with Russia, but with many other actors. I mean, look at Turkey, um, Iran, look at Turkey, Greece, uh, Turkey, Israel, um, and definitely Turkey, EU. Um, and now they're trying to, to suggest that this should be the way forward for uh, American-Turkish re relations. And um, I'm not sure that Washington disagrees entirely because um, uh, they, they also understand that despite the, the good relationship that um, Turkey and Russia have, there are also you know, points of contention and, 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 and friction between the two that they could maybe exploit, uh, capitalize on, manipulate, and so on. Uh, so they would be willing uh, for at least some time and to some extent uh, sort of um, tolerate these compartmentalized uh, relationships to, um, to try and find little windows of opportunities that would maybe um, help them bring Turkey back closer to them. Um, so um, uh, th this was, uh, I, I think we, we've already seen this to some extent and we will probably see it more. And this was definitely Turkey's uh, sort of wish and approach even before the US election. I mean, you could see numerous articles uh, and opinion editorials in, in, um, in the Turkish press uh, calling for that and saying that, you know, um, we, we work with Russia, but that doesn't mean we're pro, with, we are pro Russia. Um, we have problems with Russia, but doesn't mean we're anti-Russia. So we can do the same with the US. So uh, listen to us, hear us. We have problems as well. We, we need to. We need some uh, common understanding, and we can make this work. Um, so I, I think this is something that we should be um, waiting uh, to 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 see in this relationship. Yeah, and he, he, there ha there has been some hints that there's a receptiveness to that compartmentalization approach in some corners, at least Washington, including parts of the Biden camp. It, but it always just seemed, even in, if we look at the relationship between Turkey and Russia, that they can separate their issues to a certain extent, but then they still feel that underlying competition and say some of Turkey's issues with the West, whether it's rule of law and natural gas excavation with the EU or the situation with the Kurds and the, and Fethullah Gulen in the US, it, it, doesn't, it seems like it works better on paper, the idea of compartmentalization than ultimately in practice. Well, with Russia, it's a bit more complicated. It's, it's not exactly compartmentalization. It is to some extent, but it's also a, a, some sort of a linkage between issues, right? So they face problems in, in, in one domain and, and they, they, they have cooperation in another domain, but they somehow manage to connect issues and negotiate um, and bring everything on the table and uh, reach some, some sort of consensus, find some sort of a middle ground that um, allows their relationship to remain functional and working. Um, but uh, this doesn't mean that they've solved their problems. Uh, it only means that for the time being, they, they, uh, they are in a position to manage their problems. And th they're doing this much better than, than any, any other international actor has has done it with Turkey. I mean, if you see what Turkey, Russia are doing in, in Nagorno-Karabakh and, and Syria and Libya, this is a historic, uh, you know, um, uh, thing to see. Um, and um, the, I think the question to, to, to think about in the future will be uh, to, uh, for how long will Turkey be able to maintain this relationship uh, uh, all the while is having this problematic relationship with the West and the EU. It seems that at some point, Turkey will have to um, choose between the two. Uh, but uh, it seems that this is not Ankara's opinion. And it seems that Ankara wants to um, ma make its best to, to maintain um, a, a, an independent role between, let's say, the two camps. Uh, of, of the new world order, the, the, let's say the West and Eurasia on the other hand, um, and wants to be somewhere in the middle, pulling the strings in every direction. So we will see how that will work. 
You know, in a, in a, pre, in a previous podcast, I spoke to Mark Aliotti and he, over at the Royal United Services Institute in London, and he suggested the reason why Turkey and Russia are able to communicate together so well is because in the way to look at international affairs, it's essentially, they're speaking a very similar language. And it seems that that language is just becoming more distant and alien between, say, Turkey and the West. Especially, especially in the more recent years, since the last five years or so, that it, the gap seems to be getting bigger in a number of ways. Do you do you think do you think that that common sort of like understanding of um, between the two of them is completely gone, or do you think that there's a hope, at least in Turkey, that they can actually put this back together in some way? You kind you you already sort of answered that with um, how Turkey wants the best of both worlds, but how realistic is that, in your opinion? Well, many people for a number of years now, I mean, maybe the past 10 years, have suggested that this is not feasible in the long run. But we've seen that um, that, 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 that it has endured, right? It's, uh, Turkey is resilient in that respect. And I think that one reason this is true is because the international system is so different nowadays than 20 years ago, let's say. And um, there is space for states like Turkey, say middle powers looking to acquire a greater power status to maneuver uh, geopolitically speaking and, um, and be able to pursue their own agendas more freely without necessarily um, be, uh, being subjected to, to the will of, of greater powers or traditional allies. Um, so unless we see the US coming back strongly uh, in international affairs as a, you know, as the hegemon we once knew uh, and uh, uh, attaining a, 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 a tight grip over its, its allies and different parts of the world, um, I think Turkey will still be able to uh, maintain this, you know, third, I call it this third pole role. So, uh, you know, you have West as one pole, Eurasia as another pole, and Turkey wants to become like a third individual pole um, in the middle. And I think it will be feasible for Turkey, at least in the, in the near future. Um, one thing that could hinder that is uh, basically uh, Turkey's own actions. So if Turkey, uh, in fact, overextends and overstretches it, its power and, and operations, which it does not at this point, despite common belief, um, it, it is possible that uh, it will create major costs to itself and, um, and, and force it to fall back to probably the West because Eurasia doesn't have as much to offer. Yeah, on, on that note, this week Erdogan spoke to Charles Michel and he suggest, he repeated something that he said uh, not long ago that he wants Turkey to build its future together with Europe. But of course that's going to require some concessions. And what I want to ask you is what do you think Erdogan and Turkey might be willing to offer to change the situation and rebuild that future with Europe? Well, I think there's a lot of things they could offer and they, uh, a lot of things they could do, but it seems that they're unwilling to do them. Um, for one, um, if Turkey wa was sincere about this um, and wanted to appease concerns uh, within the EU, they could simply you know, move on with, um, uh, with domestic uh, reforms in so many sectors, uh, primarily human rights, uh, democracy, and so on, and then um, uh, mitigate their their stance in uh, in in various foreign policy issues. Uh, Cyprus is one of them. Greece is another. Um, so, uh, from this perspective, I think that Turkey does uh, that wants a relationship with the EU definitely, but on its own terms, not the not the terms of the EU. And we do know that the, that the EU is, is unable to offer Turkey, um, let's say, a full membership. Even if Turkey did everything right, uh, it would be very difficult to see something like that happening because there are certain states in the EU that 
don't want that, particularly states like France and Germany and Austria and so on. Um, but they do want a special relationship because they, there, there is a lot to be um, gained from such a relationship on, on, a, on a trade level, on a um, you know, investment level, on a security level and so on. Um, but I think there, uh, uh, it will take some time to reconfigure this relationship because this is what Turkey is trying to do. B basically put the, the Turkish EU relationship on a different basis a basis that will not be as demanding as, as previously, you know, uh, in, in the context of, of the ter Turkish ac uh, accession process to the EU. Uh, and I think the EU would like that because it will serve both their interests. No, no, no full membership, um, no break, uh, break up, but some sort of a working beneficial, mutually beneficial um, uh, um, relationship. Dr. Zanonis Ziaris, this was a great conversation and it was great to have you on. And I really do hope that you can join me again sometime soon here on Turkey Abroad. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. I'll be with you anytime. My name is Nicholas Morgan and this is Turkey Abroad.